Thank you, Jojo and Criselda, for joining us today and for bringing us up to date on finding Thermopylae in Marawi, revisiting the siege of the Philippines Islamic City. And Jojo, I'm going to ask you to start the session to set the stage and then we'll uh, transfer over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen and Dana and the staff the East West Center for inviting me again to um, another forum. Um, and good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to the people in the Philippines and all, all over the rest of Asia who are listening to this. Um, what I'd like to do today uh, is to give you an overview uh, as a way of sinking into Chris's work. Um, she's writing a book now on Marawi, and I've asked her to share some of her insights based on this book. So what I'd like to do then is show you a couple of slides uh, to give you an idea of what the context is all about. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about what happened in 2017. Um, there's a lot, of, Wikipedia is there, there's a lot of people, things written about it. But I'd just like to go back a bit and give you a background uh, before uh, going to a discussion, a Q&A discussion with Chris. So let me share my screen here. Let's give you an idea of how beautiful Marawi is. This is Marawi before 2017. Uh, one of the few pictures that colleagues from Mindanao were able, was able to take for the war. So it's a bit rock on Marawi. It's uh, the capital, it's the Islamic capital. It's an Islamic city, it's the capital of the province of Lanao del Sur. It, it, is, it adjoins a lake called Lake Marano. Uh, it reminds you very much of, you know, a, for those in Hawaii, <clears throat> um, Kaneohe or, or Kailua with more houses. It's how safe it is. Uh, it used to be called Danzalan, and it was a Spanish base in the 1600s. The Spanish tried to um, subjugate the Muslims. In 1901, it was the second headquarters of the U.S. Army. Uh, if you remember the history of the American uh, of American colonialism in the Philippines, so the American Army was tasked in establishing authority throughout the rest throughout Mindanao from 1900 to 1912. Uh, the, first, the headquarters was in Samwanga City, which uh, faces Southeast uh, Sulu Island, uh, what is now Borneo. And the second headquarters is actually Marawi. So it's very cold. It's a very nice place to go in. Um, and even up to now, actually, there are still certain villages where people, Maranao, the, the, the ethnic community there, are referred to as Little Americans. There's a village in the middle of nowhere there called Little America because apparently a lot of American soldiers decided not to go back to the U.S. after 1930 and decided to stay there. I've studied that area too, and it's fascinating to listen to the first generation of educated Maranao. They spoke like they were from New Jersey. They spoke English like they were from New Jersey, mainly because their first teachers were American teachers. So it became a chartered city in the 1940. It was changed to Marawi in 1956. In 2015, it had a population of 201,785, and the Muslim ethno-linguistic group there are called the Maranaos, although they're also referred to Mira, Miranao, okay? And just to breeze through, this is the timeline, uh, I think are the important dates for the siege. Starting May 23, government response to 2024, and then I can share this with you later if people are interested. It continues like here, um, July, um, <clears throat> took another two, three months, um, July, August four months before uh, some normalcy happened with the opening of the university and then ended in October 17 when President Duterte declares Marawi liberated. There were combat operations that followed after that, especially in the town of Butik where uh, the group that led the siege, uh, the Mauti brothers, um, lived. Okay, so the consequence is this: um, much of the city was destroyed. Uh, you have a list of um, casualties, civilian rebels, uh, um, um, re uh, terrorists, and also a number of refugees. Uh, now, government supposedly engaged with private sector and international aid agencies in rehabilitating. Marawi, but there's been complaints that the recovery has been slow. Now, <clears throat> let me then shift to a larger picture. Uh, 
Marawi is <clears throat> in an island which has had wars since 1972. There were two armed separatist movements, Muslim armed separatist movements, that tried to separate Mindanao, the Sulu Archipelago, which is in the southwest, and the island of Palawan in central Philippines, on the grounds uh, that Muslims were never part of the Philippines. Uh, the Mindanao was never part of the Philippines. It was forcibly incorporated. And that secondly, <clears throat> in the 70s, uh, that the Philippine government and Christian settlers were engaged in a systematic genocide campaign to eliminate Muslim way of life. So in 1970, a group of students who went to al Ansar University in Egypt and Saudi Arabia began to form the Moro National Liberation Front, um, uh, headed by uh, this fellow, a former professor at the University of the Philippines, Norm Zuari, and <clears throat> engaged in the Philippine government in 1975 in the only second conventional war the Philippine army was involved in. Um, <clears throat> Um, they were supplied by guns, and uh, as my cousin who was involved in the war said, you know, they were supplied by, the, the enemy was supplied by Libya and Malaysia for, with guns to toilet paper. And they uh, completely outclashed the Philippine military initially. Um, that, that group split in 77, and another group called the Mora Islamic Liberation Front was formed, uh, led by the leaders were educated in Saudi Arabia, but also gain military experience in Afghanistan when the Afghans were fighting the Russians. Um, they are better organized. Uh, they actually had a, were able to consolidate a 14,000 man force, establish two camps um, in, in, in uh, central Mindanao. Uh, I think I can use this um, here in this area. But uh, it's a more pragmatic group, which you can talk about later, because while it uh, more Islamic and committed to separatism. It was also very adept in tactical and in diplomatic tactics. It actually sought out the United States in 2004 to help mediate peace talks with the Philippine government. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the next slide is Mindanao is one of the Muslim Mindanao is one of the poorest regions of the world. I was able to get this. Uh, what the latest uh, statistics on the Human Development Index. And if you'll notice, it really long slow uh, in terms of from poverty, high in poverty, low in income, high, low life expectancy down to, you know, education and enrollment. So you're dealing with an area here that was just a war zone for a couple of decades where the people are poor, but also, okay, this is a region where there are a lot of firearms. Um, I grew up in Mindanao and one of the things, when I moved to grad school here, one of the things I used to chat with my brother is how much does armor light rifle cost now? And he would say, well, you know, the Indonesian army or, you know, the, there's a war going on in Aceh, so the guns are going there. So if you look at the statistics, of course, over half of it is in Metro Manila alone, um, but the second one is in Mindanao. Um, these are both, uh, uh, Firearms that are legally acquired, but firearms that they don't also buy legally. Then I've broken it down to within Mindanao, um, you will notice that 44.5% of firearms can be found in the Muslim zones alone. Um, R10 is region 10, yeah. In northern Mindanao, uh, the ones in the middle is, um, I'm gonna go this again is uh, both sent, uh, both Christian settlements and in non-Muslim indigenous communities and the southern part is 70% is <clears throat> most of Muslim Mindanao. So you have a war zone that's extremely poor, lots of firearms available, and this is um, where the shadow economy is strongest in the Philippines. Um, friends of ours who are involved in um, Studying this war, the Mindanao was able to start really gradually documenting the kind of shadow economy that's uh, operating in Mindanao. And if you'll notice, you know, uh, the red one is Mindanao, uh, the blue one is the national, uh, the national, the national contributions of illegal drugs. And if you see that Mindanao really uh, plays very high, it's a very high. Uh, involvement in 
the shadow economy. So what has happened now, I think, is as the rebel groups scale down uh, the resistance and starting to open discussions with the Philippine government, and as the Philippine government has integrated some of these rebel groups to help uh, run the regional government, um, politicians, you, know, you have to run for politics, so they have preponderance of guns, but also money but coming from international aid, but also money coming from the illegal sector. So it's very, very, if you go to these places in Mindanao, it's very difficult to figure out which is legal and which is illegal. Um, I'll close this with an encounter I had in a military checkpoint just outside a warlord's town where 20 people surrounded our small taxi. And what immediately struck, uh, struck me was everybody was wearing different uniforms. So more than uh, National Liberation Front uniforms, police uniforms, army uniforms, constabulary uniforms, more Islamic liberation uniforms, and the private, the uniform of the governor uh, troops. So now I realize that um, there's a lot of overlaying in, in, of identities and uh, at roles in places like Mindanao. And so with that, um, um, this is with the topic today is about the Maute group, the group that led the Mesa, uh, Marawi Sage. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic on to my friend, my good friend, Chris Hilde Yabis. Chris. Okay, so do we start with um, the family in Butig? Well, probably the good question would be, um, why the title? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, well, so we have to start from Butig. Um, if you have the map so we could show them where Butig is in relation to Lake Lanao and Marawi. Oh, I guess, uh, wait a second. I don't the have map that you showed uh, maybe uh, yesterday. Wait, uh, you want the, 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 the northern one? This one? Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, okay, that's the only map I got. No, the one that, okay. Well, anyway, um, the Butig is in the south of the lake and it's about 40 kilometers um, down from Marawi. Uh, you know, there was another map that you showed me yesterday, but anyway, um, so it's 40 kilometers down from Marawi and it's basically a godforsaken place um, there's nothing there. The semblance of government governance is basically just a small town hall and there's a basketball court in front of it. And that basketball court serves as a demarcation between warring factions where, you know, clans basically fight each other. And you have just a few kiosks, um, some makeshift houses. And, and then when you go out into the field, it's like a vast forest. And that's when you realize it's really gorgeous. And it's an ideal place to start an army. Um, you have the river there. Um, you have everything that you need uh, to basically survive. Anyway, that's how the Maute brothers started. Because even before then, um, that place was like a cluster of army uh, of rebel camps. Because it's a neighboring, it's divided between Lanao and Maguindanao. And you showed it earlier, Jojo, where uh, you know, where the, the MILF started in Camp Abu Bakar. So that's like a cl cluster of rebel camps. And um, the Maute family is basically related to one of the senior um, leaders of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So th there's, that's the ties that they had. But the brothers started putting up the black flag, the black ISIS flag. And the MILF didn't like that because they were in a peace talks with the government and they didn't want to lose the goodwill that they had started um, in the negotiations. So they were kicked out of that camp and these brothers, which is really very interesting, went to a hamlet that belonged to a relative and they started out as just a little camp. I mean, literally setting up, you know, just a tent. Um, to raise their army and they had very few at that start at the start they just had like 40 and later on it grew to about 600 but by that time they were able to get the camp that the MILF had um, and that happened because of a series of military bombard bombardments and that's another long story so from there basically they made it up to Marawi and um, in terms of seeing this 
comparing this to Thermopylae, which is a town in Greece where the Spartans, a few of them, <laughs> well, at least a, a small number compared to the Persians, were able to hide, were able to keep themselves in that place in Thermopylae. And in the same way, the Maute brothers, the Maute group, the rebel armies, the Islamists were able to do that because um, Marawi is essentially divided, oh, there it is. Marawi is essentially divided by a river, Agus River that goes into the lake. The Northern part is where you have uh, the, the big campus, the Mindanao State University and the camp, the provincial capital and the camp of um, the army's brigade head headquarters. But south of the river is where the old city is, Dansalan. And that's the, 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 the part that's really very dense where you have all the residential areas, a lot of mosque. And initially before it was really, um, well, in, in, it happens in other cities in Mindanao where you have you know, the church and the mosque standing side by side. You know, it was a very colorful cultural life. And then just over the years, it started getting crowded. Uh, they started building more things and it came to a point where you can't even tell what kind of architecture they have because it's become, it's become a mismatch. And that's what the brothers um, had. They had that advantage. They knew that place. So that's their Thermopylae. And um, they were able to cut off the soldiers because of the river. And um, in Thermopylae, the reasons the Persians were able to get into Thermopylae and beat the Spartans um, was because there was um, uh, a spy, someone who told them how to get through that place. It didn't exactly work the same way in Marawi, but they were able to find a place to go around it and start the, the attack, the offensive from the other side, from a, flank, from a flanking position. And again, using the Greek classic, um, that, that command structure was based on the idea of a trident, meaning uh, they approached it three-pronged, the spear, a spear having a three-pronged spear. And that's basically how, well, eventually they defeated the rebels. So um, could you tell us more about the rebel group then? Uh, they say it's a family, they say it's an ISIS group. They say that Abu Sayyaf and uh, uh, Southern, uh, South Indonesian and Malaysian terrorists joined it. So what exactly is it? Uh, it's, it's a combination of everything. So there's, from the very start, you've always had family ties. Um, so you have the MILF and the Mouta family and other families in Lanao as well. Um, you have that. And also because when I mentioned earlier that this was a cluster of rebel camps, in the 1990s, you also had the Jema Islamiyah there. So that's when you had the is uh, Indonesian Islamists coming and training and studying and using that place. But um, after uh, that was taken over by the military in 2000, they sort of went their separate ways and had their little cells in different parts of Mindanao. So they went some stayed in Maguindanao, some went to Sulu, um, others stayed in, in um, Lanao. Um, in 2012, a very well-known Indonesian terrorist by the name of Sanusi was actually, um, uh, was killed in Lanao, in Marawi. And at that time when the military was following him, um, I remember talking to the intelligence officer who was following him and actually uh, it was his men who, who got him, who got Sanusi, this intelligence, um, this Indonesian um, terrorist. Um, he was saying that every day in his, you know, during that time, he did nothing but think and breathe and eat Sanusi. I mean, he was, they were so obsessed with getting this guy. And that was when they found um, papers, documents that had to do with the Maute brothers. But they didn't think of it as anything big at that time. They thought that, you know, the Maute brothers were just like satellites to what the Indonesian terrorists were trying to do. Um, so the joke then was that, uh, you know, for them, they were just little Indians. And when suddenly they came to Marawi, the senior, the commander of this intelligence officer said, well, look at your little Indians. They're now big Indians. So, so you know, Huh? A prominent family in Marawi, the Maoris, 
Um, well, they're very um, prominent. Uh, they're very well known. They're very wealthy too. Uh, the mother was very, very enterprising. The father was a well-known engineer who had contracts to build places. Um, they were both they were both admired and feared and despised, you know, I mean, because it's very natural that families would be jealous, families would be angry, there's also that competition, but they certainly had their place there. And I think that's also one of the reasons why it was easy for them to recruit others. Um, because the two brothers, primarily, um, you have the second son, whose name is Omar Kayam, and the third son, whose name is Abdullah. One went to Egypt to study and the other one went to Jordan. So they come back, they stay in this small town in Butig, um, and they start preaching their jihadism. And, you know, in a place like that where, where poverty is so prevalent um, and having guns is so common, um, they, they were awed by them. You know, there were, I mean, Abdullah especially studied the Quran for, for, for seven years. So to them, it was like, well, you must know something, right? So let, let's listen to him. Um, so they were awed by, by these two brothers. They were young, they were idealistic, they were good looking, they were wealthy, uh, they had family connection. And, I, and there was also social media that, that, you know, that was spreading the news about them. So I think it was just natural that, that families, not just, I'm just talking about the poor families in Bhutan, but I'm also talking about the families in Marawi who are related to politicians. I think it's just natural for them, it was natural for them to have been drawn to these two brothers. And, and it's, in a way, it's quite easy to raise an army there. I mean, if everybody had guns, you wouldn't have to worry about where to get arms for. For, for for them for them to launch their for for them to launch their 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 um their attack their goal. So where did they get their arms? But well, in various sources you mentioned it earlier. I mean this has been going on for years. It's not as if it happens overnight that they have to start thinking of where to get their arms. It, it, you you can it's everywhere. You can have it. You know, um, and, and Marawi itself is, it, it's, there's a paradox in Marawi. It's, it's, they were trying to get back to the traditional way of Islam. But at the same time, there was also an underground thing where um, crime, um, illegal drugs, illegal firearms were, were, were festering. So you have these two things playing in that city, which is the tragedy of it all. Um, and then you also have the moderate Islams, uh, Muslims and the Salafist and the jihadist who, want, who wanted to overtake that, that kind of a system. So slowly it was getting more and more conservative and that was changing the face of the city. And also oh, another thing, um, in terms of Salafism, a lot, a lot, the scholars were saying that when they were sending students abroad um, to study, students in the Middle East to study the Quran and have this, and, and Islamic studies, um, most of the scholars that they sent were from Marawi or Maranams. So, and that kind of explained, and Maranao being a landlocked city, that kind of explained why the proliferation, the conversion, and the changes going on um, was more striking there in that city mm -hmm. as compared to, let's say, Sulu, which is an island, and Cotabato, which is a much bigger place. Maybe this will be my last question, and then we can open the discussion to um, the audience. Um, okay. So the question is, why did it take the military four months? Five months, no? Five Before months. They yeah. could take over and... Um, defeat this, what, 200, 300 rebels or terrorists who held only a part of the city. Uh, was it military experience? Was it the incompetence of the units there? Uh, who were the units involved? And so the question really is why, why? Uh, well, primarily it's lack of, lack of imagination. Uh, I mean, uh, the writing was already on the wall. You had 
um, a series of military attacks in Butig um, from 2015, late 2015, 2016. Um, and it was relentless. It wasn't as if it just happened once. And then this series of attacks moved up to Piagapo, which is just northwest of Marawi. So they were getting closer to Marawi. And you even had the brigade commander at that time standing on the hill um, of the military camp with his binoculars watching the fight that was going on in Piagapo. And he saw how relentless the, 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 the rebels were. And, but still, he took it for granted. So there is that question. I think there was, um, there was like a, a, a big difference between what the intelligence officers on the ground were thinking and what they saw and what the headquarters wanted to happen. And you also have a question of leadership. Um, I mean, most of the huh? The, the, from the chief of staff military, now. Yeah, the military hierarchy. And I, when I talk about leadership, it's what I mean, what I wanted to say is that um, in Muslim Mindanao, it's a, it's a conflict area. So it's very important for you to send commanders there who know the place, who would know how to deal with the place. But in this particular case, they sent somebody who basically didn't care. So when this happened, the place, the camp was vulnerable. There was hardly anybody there. And there were two major battalions that were even sent out of Marawi to Bukidnon in the border, in the bordering uh, neighboring province, because they were running after communist rebels. I think. Uh -huh. So when this broke out, you know, everybody was far away. Uh, nobody knew how to 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 save to save Marawi. So it's a little bit of that, the leadership problem and um, also the lack of imagination. If you have people on the ground, if you have people at the top not listening to people on the ground, then there's going to be, you know, like a, a disconnect somehow. So two, two things change happens. here. Two things seem to change here that in the past, in your books, in your old books, you mentioned that the way to rise up the ranks was to be uh, assigned to Mindanao and be involved in war. You know, you mentioned that, that, you know, yes. that, Hastens yeah. your promotion. Yes. And second is that um, the most battle-tested troops of the Philippine military are actually in Mindanao. But it seems that these two battalions really were not trained anymore to confront, you know, Muslim guerrillas who are, you know, are used to conventional warfare and more to treat the uh, to engage with communist guerrillas which are involved in the war of the fleece, so-called. So has this changed? Therefore, uh, so. Are senior officers now refusing to go to Mindanao to get promoted, or are there is there less training and less militant, you know, training and less preparedness on the part of military units now in Mindanao? Well, it's become political in a way. It doesn't necessarily. I mean, Mindanao is still a very important post. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, the Western Mindanao commander now is a candidate to become the chief of the army. So it's still a very critical and, and very important post and it's still important and the young ones still would want to be in Mindanao. I know of one officer, for example, who decided, you know, not to, uh, to leave his staff position in the intelligence service and come in the general headquarters to go back to Sulu because he wanted to be there. To him, that's still important. But I think the difference now is politics. Um, what, what the officers now are thinking is, okay, we have to also be at the right place and at the right time to be promoted. We have to be close to someone. We have to know a certain politician who is close to the president or who is close to this so we can get to the top. And the sad part is the younger ones are seeing that. So there's no rigor in choosing the right leaders to command the top positions in the military. So this, in a way, is an effect of what happened. Yeah, I'm opening you know, the CASA the discussion to audience. Um, I think there are questions here that are related in, term, in relation to the rebuilding of Marawi, managed by Alan Alvarez. Um, uh, how is COVID-19 affecting the rebuilding of Marawi? And the other one by uh, former East West Center President Charles Morrison. Uh, could be broaden out the discussion, the previous question and asked about the plans for rebuilding even before COVID and the state of the implementation. Chris? 
rebuilding. Uh, okay, I'm going to be a little blunt here, but there's really no rebuilding. <laughs> uh, 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 when after Marawi happened, um, there was a task force that was supposed to start putting this in place. But, and there was martial law too, okay? And normally martial law was to make things faster, is to make things move, but that even that didn't happen. Um, and also you had a series of, um, what do you call this when you're trying to get contracts signed? You had a series of- um, uh, Meetings? Negotiations? Yes. Huh. yes, biddings. You had a series of biddings to get the right contractors to do it. So mm -hmm. while, but that took so long. Mm -hmm. And again, it's, it has, they say it has something to do with the law, which was making it very slow. But if you had a task force doing it, that could have been faster. And if you had martial law, supposedly, uh, that could have made it faster too, but that didn't happen. So when that was going on, the people who were only trying to clean up the city because there were unexploded bombs. You know, there was debris all over the place. I mean, the place was total chaos. It's all gray, it's all rubble. If you've seen pictures of what happened in Raqqa and, and, and in other parts of Syria, it's pretty much the same thing. You don't recognize anything anymore. And what was sad for me when I saw the people who, trying to return, who were trying to return to just get some of their stuff after the six, on the sixth month after the war, was that they were trying to hang on to something, you know, even if it's just um, a ruined sofa, you know, something from their kitchen, or even a door frame. They were trying to do that. They were trying to get whatever they could sell, they could keep from that rubble, they could get from that rubble. So during that time, it was just basically the combat engineers who were doing the basic stuff, like recover uh, the weapons, the bombs that were unexploded, and they were not, you know, um, equipped to do all of that. And that was the reason why they needed the contracts from other companies to do these things. I mean, companies that had the technology and the equipment to do that. So it took a much longer time. And someone recently showed me a picture of how one part of it is basically gone and it's all now green. I mean, so of course you have, you know, weeds growing, plants and growing. And in fact, the last time I was there, I saw like patches. The place was like a patch of uh, vegetable because while you were in the rubble, you would see, oh, cherry tomatoes, oh, squash, oh, you know, eggplants. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was like a jungle taking over from the rubble. Yeah. And government. Can, can I interact? In, Jojo, can I just ask a quick question? We have a request because you spent so much time with talking about the Mote brothers yeah. to flash that picture up again. Are you able to find that, Jojo? Because there was a lot of discussion about them. And I believe you said they're just two brothers, but the picture had a lot of people on that. So, okay. Yeah. If you can find that. And then I think if. Just to give some idea who these, it's a Maote group, but who are the brothers in here? Okay, the two, uh, the one, okay, you see the father on the upper left. Right. And the mother after. Okay. And then that's Abdullah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oops. <laughs> uh, okay. okay. So the top two, okay. Yeah, and then, uh -huh. yeah, the top two on the right. So that's okay. Abdullah and Omar Kayam. Okay. Um, people always, people were always saying that Abdullah was the older brother, but no, it's actually Omar Kayam. Okay. And the reason why they were giving a lot of importance to Abdullah is because he was the strategist, the okay. one who studied the Quran, the, someone who was going to be the religious leader as well, because okay. he, he had that status, uh, academic status, so to speak. Um, the Mote family, uh, the father, I mean, because the father has two wives, one of them is Farhana, the mother, who is very, very influential. Um, um, they have, they had 12 children, so seven boys and five girls. Um, all the brothers, all their sons are believed to have been killed in the, in the fighting. Um, the girls are all in jail with the mother. Uh, the father um, died 
in custody um, when he was sent to Manila. He was caught at the checkpoint in Davao and was sent to a, a high security prison in Manila and he died of lingering illnesses. Um, so the mother is also in a maximum security um, jail here in Manila uh, with her daughters, except one who had, well, she didn't escape because of the war. She, there was an incident that happened in 2016. There was a jail, um, uh, uh, there was a jailbreak and she was one of those who escaped. But there's a nice story to this, but I can't talk about it right now. It's another <laughs> Thank long you. story. It's gonna be Thank you. I think we can, we can leave this picture and we do have a series of other questions. Okay. Um, one is uh, actually from Melinda Kirkfleet. Uh, just what is the situation now at MSU? Oh, um, frankly, right now, I have not really been in touch with people at MSU. Um, the last interview I had was with someone there in 2019. So that was a long time ago. And I started writing the book, so I hadn't gone back since then. But um, it's back to normal from what it was when I was there in 2019. And in fact, what's really interesting is that behind the campus, it's still part of the campus, but behind it, you have um, a lot of cafes. Okay. And these are chic cafes. These are not just, you know, your hole in the wall cafes. I mean, they had uh, an atmosphere of something that would make you feel like you were in Paris. <laughs> they even have French names. And, and there were, when I went there, lots, there were lots of kids who were there. So I think somehow they were trying to come back to life and try to get back to what was normal. And I like being in that cafe because I could see, you know, the male and female together talking like it's, you know, it seemed very vibrant. And I like that kind of atmosphere. I mean, I hope it stays that way. Some normalcy. Yes. Um, yes. We do have a, uh, an anonymous attendee who's asking, um, how have developments in autonomy in Mindanao affected stability in the region? Specifically, have they appeased separatist groups who are committed to combat operations? That was a big deal, I think, not too long ago. So okay. how is that? I don't know, Jojo, I don't know but if you can have- Can answer that? Because that's with BARM. That has to do with BARM. Um, I think the big separatist groups have um, decided to make peace with the government. The more Islamic Liberation Fund is basically running this new um, new version of the autonomous region governing Muslim in the now. Um, I, I think that's more or less done. The problem really are the smaller groups, the breakaway groups, right. uh, the kids coming back from Syria who you know, engage in this small, small, you know, small fire, small fire warfare, right. which would have limited impact, but which every news media would then, you know, elab uh, show as something serious. Okay. Bombing here, there's in insecurity in Mindanao. Bombing there, there's insecurity in Mindanao. But what's fascinating, for example, this Marawi crisis was that the Moro Islamic Liberation Front and the Philippine Army worked together to get the evacuees out of the city. So there is a collaboration between the two armies. And the MILF is actually worried about the fact that unless something meaningful uh, uh, arrangement in terms of autonomy is made that would last between the film government and the MILF, the younger ones would start be, would start be getting attracted, being attracted, get attracted to Salafism and the ISIS. I think you kind of captured that when you explained the chaos and everyone in different uniforms. Right. Just trying to figure out who was on what side. So and the sign that the MILF is actually really serious about this is they're actually sending their smarter kids, smarter uh, cadres to school, to management schools in Japan, in Malaysia, in Manila, and really to learn how to run a government. Uh, the other separatist group did not. So there is going to be. I think the bigger stop separatist groups are going. You know, are are shifting to a peaceful engagement with the government. It's the smaller ones that we worry about. But I think also independent of the MILF, you also have young Muslims who are very smart, who have studied abroad, independent of their families, independent of the MILF, independent of all this scholarship given by Saudi Arabia or Iran. So you also have this pool of young, smart, 
you know, um, inspiring uh, Muslims who know, who, who can plan things. And I hope they're given more chance says, to do something for their place instead of still latching on to the political dynasties, to the traditions of the old families. Um, you have that. So I, I see them as potential to changing the landscape of the place, but that's going to be like an uphill struggle, I think, for now. Because for the second question from the anonymous attendee is the relationship within the armed groups. Right. Uh, one thing that I think, you know, I forgot to mention was this, the violence in Mindanao is not just between armed groups, separate groups, it's also between clans, you know, Families. these clan wars uh, that, you know, cuts across several generations. Yeah. Uh, which bring, if a clan goes into war with another clan, they bring everybody in, the, the policeman cousin, the rebel cousin, the army cousin, and then you go to war. Yeah. Uh, and that, if that is and in, a, in, a, in a context where there's a lot of firearms, that would continue. In fact, one of the Maranao residents was interviewed said, hey, I thought this was Rido, the clan war. It's worse, you know? They're not just beheading people, they're really shooting people, communities. Um, and so that's also part of the quote unquote normal life in Mindanao. And unless government is able to deal with this, uh, it's going to persist and create, you know, a, a, a situation where, you know, the conditions will continue to be volatile. Now, the interesting thing here is that clan wars are resolved through the mothers. Yeah. Means Women are really powerful. Precisely. Not uh, really. <laughs> yeah, and it's very interesting in this as in Philippines, and Chris right. uh, can um, talk more about this, that conflicts are resolved not by the men, but by the mothers, you know. No. You negotiate over how many heads of cow mm -hmm. should we get for you killing my nephew, it's mom. So, so that's an, an really interesting thing because it's also a big deterrent to Islamic terrorism because Salafism doesn't give any value to women's contribution. That was surprising to me when I heard about the powerful, the mothers and the role they were playing in a lot, so. Yeah, the Mauti mom, the mom is really the most yeah. powerful one. Yes, yeah. Chris? So the third, oh, Chris, did you want to um, add to that? No, 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 was, it's okay. Okay. But no, I was just gonna, just a little bit like, I think it's not so much, well, government, I'd like to also think that the new um, autonomous region, this is their chance now to change the structure. Yeah. Uh, this is really, it's a make or break. Yeah. This is their really chance to, to, to you know, improve the situation in, the, in Mindanao, to change the structure and to make it open for young ones to thrive mm -hmm. instead of running away from the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the last of that anonymous question uh, questioner is, has a Marawi siege demonstrated the need for the AFP to maintain a training relationship with the United States military and a semi-permanent US military presence in the region? Huh. <laughs> huh. Um, offhand, offhand, um, I would say yes. Um, I think it's, it's important during the Marawi battle, the. Uh, the Americans were actually there, um, but you know, doing things below the radar in the sense that they couldn't really be there as combatants, but they were helping out in surveillance, um, intelligence information, um, and stuff like that, which was very critical to the battle. Really, it, it helped in that sense. Uh, so, and also, um, the forces that were there, very few were actually trained in counterterrorism. So in fact, they were doing their, it was like on the, on the job training. They were learning things as the battle unfolded. You know, it wasn't as if they went there and they knew exactly what to do. This right. caught them by surprise. The rebels were using tactics that they had never done before. So this was new for them. And those that really, the, the soldiers, the forces that were really successful were those that were trained in counterterrorism. And they were not even trained in this scale, but still they managed. Um, so this force, they call them like sort of like the equivalent of the Delta Force. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, I'm saying that in a very loose way, it's not quite the same, but um, you know, they were the one who made inroads, they made things faster. 
for the troops to move. Um, so yeah, offhand, I'd say yes, but maybe with some limits, some limitations. And what they are, it's not for me to say because I'm not a military commander. So You just study, you just write about the military. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go. Uh, Georgie Engelbrecht has a question on, um, at the beginning of the Maute group, it looked like ideology plays less a role compared less a role compared to the typical local issues and local conflicts. Uh, then we have incidents like the execution of sawmill workers uh, put into orange jumpsuits over a clear okay. sign of mim mimicking global ISIS. Right. Um, and then, of course, the end game of the siege. Do you think the uh, Salafi jihadist ideology was there from the start? or developed over the months toward the, this violent conclusion? And was it the plan all along? Any particular insight? George, I wanna start first? Yeah, me? Yeah, uh, I'll start first. The fascinating thing about, uh, there's an interesting take on all these uh, things is that you imitate what's out yeah. there. Social media plays it. Uh, I doubt, for example, that, uh, so you advertise it. And it really falls into a unique city like Marawi. Marawi has no newspapers, okay? Uh, I think there's what one radio station. So the way people announce you know, themselves socially is to put these big character, big posters, like, you know, uh, congratulations, Crisilda, for passing nursing exam. X the tarpaulins. Yeah, so it's the tarpaulin, the city of tarpaulins of people being congratulated. Congratulations, Omar, for going to the Hajj. You know, uh, and I think uh, that combined with social media was what made these groups, the Maoti groups or groups supporting the Maoti, use the same tactics. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think it's 50 50. Uh, Marawi still, a lot of Marawi kids still are funded by the Saudis to go to schools in the Middle East. The Saudis are very, very active in, in, in Muslim in the now. Mm -hmm. The question is when they go back, they start talking about jihad and to a certain extent, in the case of the Maori, I think the charis charisma and the connections got them into, uh, uh, got people interested in what they were saying, but it's also a limit to that. And you can actually see it on who else was participating in the rebellion. Um, later, I'll show you a, 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 a schematic I made of the connections within Maori, the Maori, the, fam the family and the different political actors involved in Marawi and it, the composition is quite just fascinating. So, which means then that you can come back and talk about the Quran, about Islam, the people would say, well, where's the money? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but and, also because Georgia, the Imams are not well off, right? It's not like yeah. the Catholic church where the priests, they have their parishes, they get money out of that. Mm -hmm. in, in Mindanao, it's not the same thing with the Imams. So to, at some point, they're beholden to people who would give them money, who would make them survive, right? Especially in a place that's very poor. Um, I think, don't you think? I mean, that's how I saw it in Sulu. But also there's a dynamic uh, among the rebel groups. So for example, you have Isnilo and Hapilon, who is from Bastilan in the Southern Islands, going to Marawi to be the emir, the prince, to launch this war um with the Maute brothers and make Marawi the province the wilayat mm -hmm. so it's it's this is like in a way a deviation from what the MILF and what the MNLF were doing mm -hmm. the MNLF and the IMLF MILF were you know for um autonomy separatism and all that but the religious factor was never really as strong as it was with with the situation in Marawi so in a way, they made that break, mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 been there. The, Sal the 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 influence of Salafism and Jihadism, it was there since they started building their own camp. What in 2014, 2015, and um, I mean, and remember, you know, Abdullah was studying in Jordan at that time, and Al Sarkawi, who did the Blitzkrieg in Mosul, is from Jordan. So he. He knows this. I mean, and there are several groups that they might have met when they were abroad. And we plus have, the influence of the Indonesians and the Malaysians coming in. We have uh, two final questions. I think that's all we'll have time for from Fred Magdalena. 
I think Fred is also from that area, isn't he from Marawi? Yeah. So Fred, thank you for joining us. Um, but could you tell us why rehabilitation is taking so long despite martial law in Mindanao? Uh, Maranaos, Mara I'm probably pronouncing these wrong. Sorry, Jojo, sorry, no, 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 no. Um, are getting impatient uh, why they still could not go back to Marawi to rebuild their homes. The temporary housing could only provide a few thousand residents in a nearby place. So we'll answer that for one quest, mm -hmm. question first and then we'll go on to the next one. Yeah. Either way. Okay, um, primarily it's the biggest problem that we have in this country and it's not just in Marawi and it has to do with politics. Anything that we do has, it, there's always politics in the way. And it, this, this didn't just happen in Marawi. It was the same thing too in Samwanga when, you know, when rebels tried to attack a small uh, coastal village. It's the same thing. It's gone. It's never been rehabilitated. And you don't even know where the people are now, people living there. Um, in Marawi, it's a combination of everything. Um, there's politics, there's incompetence. Um, and, you know, when they were trying to plan this, one group wanted something else, another group, one group wanted to build like a, a new Dubai. Uh, another group just wanted something simple, like building a new township outside of Marawi, mm -hmm. uh, where there's space, because Marawi is very, very crowded, but nobody wanted to listen to that. So you have these clashes, conflict of ideas, and if there's no political will, nothing will come out of it. Thank you. Yeah. Jojo, did you want to add to that? Oh, I just actually, just a, 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 a story. I met a, a politi prominent politician actually from Marawi, from Milano del Sur, the province, saying, mm -hmm. well, you know, if I build a gymnasium here, the NBA will come. <laughs> Wait, I think there was a movie about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. The, the NBA, the middle of nowhere, the war goes. Like, okay. Okay, the second one is um, there's also a problem about getting back their lands because most of them don't have titles as a large part of Marawi belongs to military reservation that was established way back during the American period that you talked right. about. Yeah. Um, how do you think the government will resolve this? And it looks like the physical development plan will ease out many of them with the new structures being proposed to be constructed in place of their homes and businesses. So comments? Um, I, I, ha I had a friend who was involved in this rehabilitation program. He was, he's not with government, he's, he was with an NGO. Uh, no, he was with ARM at that time. Um, one of the plans that they had was to bring, for example, because the, the city, the, that lower part of the city was like in grids in a way. So they were going to bring families to go to, let's say, the first grid and say, okay, who are the families living here and what do you want and how can we do this? But that never came about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if nobody comes and says, this is what we should do, and this is how it's going to be done, nothing will ever happen. There were also plans and proposals to give them money to build their own place outside of the city. And um, that also that never transpired. And sometimes when I would go, I mean, I, I went there three times in the course of my research after the battle, um, I, I would always wonder, you know, why do they want to come back to this place? I mean, I wouldn't want to go back here when you have the energy of violence, you know, bloodshed in, 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 in the city, right? It's, it's ruined, everything's gone. I mean, I would want to live elsewhere, just give me the money and live elsewhere. But of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian living in Manila saying this, right? And so when I talk to the women um, and other um, refugees, they'd say, but that's where we belong, you know? Our culture, they had the pre-Islamic um, uh, culture that goes back in, in time saying that basically they're the people of the lake, they have to be close to the lake and without the lake, Marawi would not be Marawi. Um, so that's their, their, it's, that's strong for them too. That's where they came from. That's their heritage. That's their culture. And, you know, the government didn't give them that at least. Actually, I do think we have time for one more question, but we have, um, from anonymous again, uh, isn't, uh, MILF connected with, uh, wasn't, I guess, weren't they connected with Al Qaeda before? And they were supporting Islamist ideologies before, but shifted to a political diplomatic approach in the 2000s. 
So we can wrap up this discussion if you want to tackle this one. Yeah, Jojo, that's for you. And, uh, uh, I think uh, this time, this is a time where I'll show the last slide. Okay. okay. It's actually this one. Ah. Yeah, this that's how complicated is, it is. <laughs> this is that complicated. I was trying to figure out connections between the Maoris and the different political forces. And you will notice that here. Um, okay. I think I want this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is the, the brothers, the sort of brothers, okay? Uh, they, this mom okay. who has connections with Indonesian terrorists because she has business in Indonesia. J.I. Omar and Abdullah went to connection with ISIS. I uh, was also for, uh, responsible for training some of the terrorists in the Abu Sayyaf in the Sulu Archipelago, one of which became Ismail uh -huh. al They became buddies, okay. Farhana's- For convenience. Uh, yeah. They became so buddies Farhana for convenience. Has relatives in the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. In fact, one of the uncles actually was said to have sent his uh, his, his, own, his own army. He was uh, I mean the husband was a former MILF guerrilla, and they're still relatives in the Butik area because Butik is the uh, the other military camp of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. So you can see the uh, like it. So sends army here, and then Omar and Abdullah have cousins, twelve you know, siblings, but they were also, uh, as Chris mentioned, they're very they were actually extremely charismatic, intelligent brothers, and they were able to draw a lot of young Muslims from the Mindanao State University. A um, friend of mine, other friend of mine, hopefully is going to share her insights on this, a younger Muslim. Uh, she was involved in actually not only rehabilitating, but also engaging her, her students in a debate over Islam, uh, Islamic principles. So you have these guys, and then you have this, okay? Mayors Fahor, Salik, and Solitario are relatives of Farhana Maudi. Solitario is a former commander of the Moro National Liberation Front. His brother, Fahor, is connected with this group called the Lucky, Mayor Lucky Seven Club, which runs, uh, which basically they are the, uh, the, you know, if Tony Soprano was the capo, the Tutti capo, these are the, the lieutenants. These lieutenants, the seven mayors, run the drug trade. Uh, mainly of uh, methamphetamines, which is uh, funded by a, a Chinese businessman. Uh, everybody knows, but don't mention. So these guys are connected to the drug syndicates, uh, of which Marawi, the south of Marawi, is actually as one of the biggest methamphetamine factories in Mindanao. I know that because my hometown, Osami, is just what, an hour away from Marawi? So our, the mayor who was killed three years ago, our mayor, was the, was the partner in the heroin trade um, uh, and got much of the methamphetamine from Marawi. And then the drug syndicates have relatives in the Moro National Liberation Front. A lot of them still have their armies, but some of them have decided to go into politics. And for you to win politics, you need money, like the way Solitaire is able to do that. Fahor is actually a very scary guy. <coughs> so the yeah. community, <coughs> at that point, Muslim community, uh, youth are connected to community, some of whom also <coughs> have uncles uh, who joined the Moro Bang Samura Islamic Federation Freedom Fighters, which are a breakaway group from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. BIFF, BFF, <coughs> as one of the most battle tested uh, cadres of the MILF. So here's the network. <laughs> I hope <coughs> it, it answers, but also not answers the last question. Think, I think it uh, reinforces the complexity you know, yeah. of this. So thank you both. Actually, you can take that screen down now. It's seared okay. in our brain how complex it is. <laughs> but um, thank you both so much. Thank you, Chris, for joining us from Manila. I know you're still in lockdown because of COVID-19 there. Um, we wish you well. Uh, as you know, our country is also dealing with it. Uh, the mm -hmm. world is so um but thank you thank you both very much for joining us and jojo we'll see you a wave across campus yeah, to you. Across campus, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you all you thank you and thank you to those who joined us today good day Nan.